my name is Janice B. Gordon, and this is Scale Your Sales Podcast. Welcome to Scale Your Sales Podcast, listed number nine of 43 best podcasts for every sales professional. I am Janice B. Gordon, the customer growth expert, recommended by LinkedIn Sales as one of 15 innovating sales influencers to follow. In today's episode, my guest talks about coaching leaders. This is the title of his latest uh, book. Now, he talks about his time as a sales leader and the transition he had to go on and many of the mistakes he made. We went on to discuss about why coaching is so important rather than directing your team and switching off 50% of them. You're going to love this conversation because my guest shares so much of what he learned from his own experience. As an award-winning business leader with over 25 years experience in sales and leadership, my next guest is the founder of Focus for Growth, as in number four, Focus for Growth, a sales and leadership training company specializing in B2B markets. He is the best-selling author of Inspire, Influence, Sell, and host of Inspire Sales Podcast. Please welcome to Scale Your Sales Podcast, Justin Lee. Thank you, Janice. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Well, it, it's lovely um, seeing you at the Institute of Sales Professionals speaking and sharing your knowledge and content. And, you know, I've kind of we're both in the UK. Mm. I mean, it's not such a big community. So you often know who are the kind of key people and floating around. So it's really nice to get an opportunity to get to know you you better. Yeah, but thank first, you. First, first I, I know that you, you're an author of, of two books and this is one of them. <laughs> inspire influence and sell but the i would love to talk about coaching because this is really a, mm. in, uh, an important subject and your experience around coaching leaders which is the the name of your your second book that's right there you it have is. it <laughs> <laughs> i thought i'd better show you it yeah i've just literally got the author copies in the last week brilliant so yeah. you've got the author copies when is it is it out now or it is, is it launching soon it is it's available it is available now yes right it's, so yeah. why coaching leaders? What is it in particular that you've discovered that where the gap was that you felt needed to be filled? Yeah, it's, an, it's a great question. Thanks, Janice. Uh, so I had two epiphanies throughout my career. Only and my two? Career, Justin, what well, have you well, in I your have, life? <laughs> I had the two of them, but probably had them multiple times. But right. they're, the, they're the two that really, really kind of stopped me in my tracks. And um, they they relate to coaching as a leadership style and consultative selling. And the first was when I was in a sales role. And I'd been in a sales role for a couple of years before I was trained. Mm. I finally went to work for a very large company. First thing they did was was train me in, in sales. And, and the, the approach they took was a consultative sales approach. So actually start, start to lean into your customer conversations, switch the narrative from you doing all the pitching to really understanding what does your customer need, ask them questions about you know the challenges they're facing, the goals that they're looking to set for their organization, and, and actually what are the barriers they face? Why haven't they achieved those goals already? And, and really start to you know craft that com- conversation with the customer so that it becomes really customer-centric and gets the customer to start to sell themselves on you. And that's the important distinction, that the customer starts to sell themselves on you. And when I learned that approach, and I've been continually refining it over the last, you know, coming up to 30 years, it was just, it was a real light bulb moment for me. And then I was in sales probably for about 10 years for different companies. And then I was asked or invited to apply for a sales management role. So my first sales management role I applied for, I went into the position and realized that I kind of slipped back into my previous sales habits, which was instead of pitching, I was directing. And and I think it's a trap that very often high-performing salespeople fall into. They get promoted into management or leadership positions because they've been a high performer. They think that the skills that got them there are the same skills that are going to make them successful as a manager, and they're not. There's a transition that needs to happen. You know, instead of doing all, you know, running the tasks, doing the sales activities yourself, you know, driving yourself to be a high performer, if you take that approach with teams, you're going to tune probably 50 to 60% of the people out. Some people will love it. 
but some people will absolutely hate it, especially if they've got a different style from you. And that's when that transition from directive manager to coaching leader is really important because that way you can understand what someone else's motivations are, what does high performance look like to them? How do they start to translate that into improvements and development for themselves? And you do that through a coaching approach so that the change comes from the person you know, inside out from the person rather than outside in from you directing them. And that that is the big shift. They're, as I say, they're the two defining moments for me. There, there are more, I promise you, Janice, but they were the two big light bulb moments for me in my career. All right. I want, I want to delve into this because, yeah. you know, I um, work uh, like you, you know, I was selling and worked in financial services. This is in the 1990s and yep. was with a small company and went to a larger company and did a lot more of the kind of like sales training. I don't know when you had your sales training, but I, mine at that point wasn't customer focus. And so mine was in the 1990s and yeah. financial services. And it was, you know, the kind of seven steps sales process and all of the fact finding and discovery and asking questions and all of that. But yeah. really, it was very much. And I found this even into like kind of like. 2005 or so really about asking questions to lead people to your solution as mm. opposed to asking questions to understand more about their um uh, business uh imperatives and you know yeah. goals at that time mm. you know there was and it's a subtle but it's an important switch so i'm mm. interested as to when you got all of that customer focused training on the the kind of discovery that that you had because i wasn't on that that track for you know <laughs> a while and actually there's a lot of sales people that are still not on that track so how did that's that true. happen that's true yeah and you, you're absolutely right and as i think back the first time i went through it, it was actually uh, professional selling skills i think it was three professional selling skills three and and it was customer focused, but it was it, but it was leading the customer to the right outcome, so that there was a fit between what you were offering and what they were looking for. It was actually the the iteration of that when I went, uh, I joined 3M in 1999, and that's when there was a big transformation for me. So it was 99, kind of end of the 90s, as we went into the year 2000 onwards. That's when the the shift happened for me, and there were lots of different programs I went on that started to talk about think about the buying journey of the customer, think about the sales process for yourself in, in line with the customer's buying process and really start to look at kind of chunking up. So not thinking tactically about what you're trying to sell, but think about what, as you said, Janice, what those customers' goals, aspirations are for the future, and then try and join up the dots from what they're trying to achieve to what you can provide an offer. And, and actually you'll find that you, you, create much more relevance for a customer you're much like much more likely to have a customer that's, that will be with you for longer term and they'll start to recommend you to their to people in their network so that strategic view of a sales conversation with a customer it does take some some kind of reconditioning because th they tend to be longer it tends to be a slightly longer sales cycle but you get much higher reward uh, as a result for you and for the customer Absolutely. I mean, my epiphany was when I moved out of sales mm. and worked in customer experience and I did all of these customer experience journeys. And I realized that customers, are your best innovators and creators, mm. and, you know, they really know what they want. And so, you know, put that into sales. It's actually they know what they want. They don't always know how to achieve it. And that's where you, you know, us as salespeople come in. And I thought, oh my God, all of this experience, all of this knowledge I gained in sales, we've got it, we've got it twisted. We <laughs> think we know everything and we're telling, you know, the, the customer. Actually, the customer has everything and it's more about collaboration. And that very much kind of fed into my journey. That's why I love what you have to say in your experience, because uh, you know, we're kind of coming at it from different paths, but into mm. the same thing, um, you know, yeah, and it completely. really was about let's start with a customer and work back from from there. And that's how, mm. you know, scale yourselves came about. So now wow. if we move back the second prong to what you were talking about with coaching so yes. it was really great you sharing your experience and your epiphany there and why why coaching and rather than directing is really in, important in terms of um not switching off 50 percent of 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 your team so you made that epiphany many other sales leaders it's very difficult 
for them to see that when they've been very successful salespeople. It's not, I've done it, so you've got to do it in the way that I've done it, so I'm going to mm-hmm. direct you. How how do you get those leaders to make that switch, to see that there is another way, and you still get success? Because that must that's quite a mind shift uh, into the unknown, something they've never done or wasn't actually done to them when they were you know, successful salespeople. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it starts certainly with the, with the process we go through. It starts with that leader actually having an experience where it's probably not optimal. So they've been in a leadership position for a while. They probably are jumping in and micromanaging their teams. And what they will be finding, as I found uh, in my career, and I, I'd love to say I only made the mistake once, but I'd be completely lying. I made the mistake multiple times and actually had to reset myself. But what they'll be finding is that they are having to solve all the problems in their business and in their team. They'll be jumping into rescue deals. They'll be giving really, really clear and frequent direction. They'll be asked questions and they'll be thinking to themselves, I'm sure I've answered this before. And, and that dependence that you create within your team is, is completely unintentional and very often even aware it's happening and it's not until they make that that kind of shift in their awareness where they start to think actually i am continually having to solve the same problems i am having more ball and i see them sometimes in a way that's highly capable and they drift back off track and what to themselves how is the recovery and it's not until they get that sense that there must be something else I could be doing that the change is possible. Because if somebody says, well, actually, what I'm doing is working, why do I need to change the coaching? Then then they probably need a little bit more experience of you know, a style that doesn't work. Once someone actually says, I, I need to make a change, is the kind of catalyst really for wanting to make a, a shift in the way that and gone, having gone through this many times myself, and with of course, is that it, it, there's this mindset shift that has to change first. Then there is a, a skill change that has to happen. So people have to start to create a bit more space in conversations. They have to put themselves on pause a bit and stop jumping in and just offering answers. They have to step back and start to see the potential in their teams and start to cultivate some of those more coaching based conversations, which don't occur naturally to us, because when we're highly experienced, we do want to provide the solution. There's a there's a a short, sharp dopamine hit that happens when we give someone an answer. We feel good. Oh, I've, I've just rescued that situation. But long term, what that does for our teams is it creates dependence on us. It just means that over time, we find ourselves unable to then create the space and time for strategy and the most important activities within our leadership role. So once we start to make that shift in awareness, then it's about putting into practice the skills and the change in skills that we need to move from directive to coaching kind of lead. And, and we, I mean, there's lots of models in the market. There's a great, there's lots of great books. Obviously, there's my new book, Coaching Leaders. Where I started was with uh, the Sir John Whitmore book, Coaching for Performance. And in that book, he lays out the what is effectively the gold standard grow model. So if, if people are new to coaching or they haven't had experience with the grow model, definitely worth looking it up, you know, do an internet search for the grow coaching model. That will really help you. And as part of the work we do, we integrate the grow model as part of a leadership cycle. So as we think about what does it take to effectively coach people, having a simple model that you know you can go back to time and time again, that as you ask the questions in sequence, you're going to guide your team members or, or even peers, sometimes even your, your line manager, start to guide them through that structured coaching model, it starts to give you confidence that in any situation, regardless of what comes up, if you can follow a structure that you know will give you the, the outcome or give the other person you're talking to the outcome they're looking for, that can be really effective. So th- there's, a, there's a number of things in there. It's you know awareness to change in the first instance, having a reason to, to move, and then having a structure that you can follow that gives you confidence that, that you can do that re, you know, reproducibly time and time again. That, that's the challenge. And I would imagine you know the uh, sales industry, um, you look very much like a sales leader. Thank you. you know. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> that that, um, that is a, you know, and it's true, but if we look at the demographic of, of what is a, a, a sales leader, you've come out of that in, environment, um, but, you know, it, that environment is, there's only, what, 17%, if that, less than that, of female uh, sales leaders in the industry globally, which mm. is pretty um, uh, uh, tragic. And I wonder if you found that, um, when you're uh, working with female sales leaders, whether there's a difference in the approach that they naturally use and how much adaption between, uh, and I think it's quite general, obviously, not all men and women act the same, but I'm keen to hear from your experience whether you see that there are subtle differences as to what people naturally do. It's a great question, Janice. I didn't know that stat, by the way. I didn't realise it was only 17%. Uh, it, it's interesting, as I think about my own clients, I've probably got a 50-50 split between male and female. I, I work with quite a few female sales leaders. And for me, what I've, what, so what I have noticed is it's more about personality style. So, so what, what are their preferences? How do they like to operate? Um, what, one of the things that I think does come more naturally to female leaders that I've worked with is, is being empathetic. I think nat natural empathy, and I, I guess you know there, there's a piece around ego. Uh, I think from from my experience, so there's no kind of hard, hard data in here, but my experience is that female leaders tend to be more empathetic and tend to be able to connect with their teams uh, more effectively. I, I think it doesn't, but it doesn't get in the way of them being able to make tough decisions have difficult conversations they're just able to manage that blend i think more effectively and it i have to say early in my sales leadership career that's something i struggled with i've almost felt like i had to fit the mold you know you said you look like a sales leader i felt like i had to act like a sales leader and actually there's there's definite benefit in taking that more professional approach but we are dealing with human beings, you know, salespeople, sales teams, our colleagues, our peers, they're human first. <laughs> so we have to empathize. We have to appreciate that they'll have things going on for them that, that sometimes they'll need some nurturing. They might need, you know, just a more empathetic conversation. You know, as somebody that might be struggling a bit will need a different conversation than someone who's, who's absolutely flying and, and high performing. And our ability to flex ourselves, it's a bit like, you know, I, I often think, that sales leadership and in fact leadership more generally is very much like sales in to be effective in a sales position we have to be chameleons we have to be able to flex to the person in front of us we have to be able to handle some of those awkward moments and it's exactly the same in leadership we have to be able to meet the needs of each member of our team and be able to meet the collective needs of the team we have to be able to do that through a way, in a way that gives us both connection with the person and optimal performance and results and that's not always an easy balance to strike. Nobody will get it right 100% of the time, but recognising two things are in uh, kind of a priority at the same time is really important. Yeah, yeah. I wonder then with um, female uh, leaders, because I don't, you know, mm. that that being more empathetic, I'm sure that's across the board um, in leadership. Mm. Uh, do you feel that that is a, a skill uh that is needed more now post pandemic. And so that in, because of that, they, there's a potential for them to be more effective leaders going forward. I absolutely think it is a, a skill that's required. I think yes, post pandemic is, is one of the reasons. The other reason I think is because of the differences in the generations. We heard a, a speech last week, didn't we Janice, about you know the differences in the generations in the workforce. And, you know, as we think about the, the next generation, you know, my, my children are 26 and 23 and the way they operate in the workplace compared to how I operate in the workplace and what they need from, you know, their, their leaders, mentors, coaches is different from what I needed. So we have to recognize, I think, the importance of that transition in the needs of our team members. And does that make women potentially more you know suited for leadership in the future i'd have to see some evidence to, to oh, say I think, controversial <laughs> isn't it? I, I think i think the answer is probably yes but um but it doesn't mean that men don't have empathy i think it does take more for men to to cultivate it and 
certainly for me, it wasn't until I got more confidence in myself to be myself that I was able to demonstrate and display that empathy. Uh, earlier on in my career, I felt I, I think I felt I needed to fit a mold that actually was just something I'd created in my mind rather than something that was required. And and actually working with you know a, a mentor or or a peer group, you know, if you're in an organization where there are other leaders, having these conversations about leadership, I think that's one of the big gaps. People talk about you know sales and functional effectiveness. Whatever your position in an organization, if you've got a salesperson, you tend to talk about okay, what are the skills that make that salesperson successful? There isn't, uh, there hasn't been up until recently that same focus on leadership and developing leadership. I think that's a really important consideration as people start to think about what does it take for them to be effective leaders in the future, start to have those conversations and you will learn from other people that are successful in leadership. You'll also learn, as I've done in my career, you'll learn as much from the bad leaders or managers you work for as you do from the good leaders. Well, probably even more, you know, Mm. I've certainly Mm. um, left the sales industry because of uh, uh, bad managers and and leaders. But, you know, when I, you know, I ran a restaurant and bar and had, you know, 20 employees that helped me to become a better leader because I didn't want to be like like that so often it's it's the worst experiences where you learn the greatest lessons isn't it absolutely yeah moments of growth I think uh, I heard Steve (laughs) Bartlett talk about them recently said let's stop talking about imposter syndrome or you know challenges where we think we're out of our depth and start talking them talking about them as moments of growth it's a really important distinction because that helps us to lean into those moments rather than step back I, I didn't think that's it. I mean, I thought what the point you made about um, empathy and the generation, multi-generation is a great one, but I, there's another one as, as well, a bit of an aha moment, because I think it's um, it's interesting. There's so much talk about, I was out last last night and, you know, the imposter syndrome, as if as if it's something negative or as if, and it was, it, particularly imposter syndrome in, in women. It's like, yeah. it's like men don't have it we all have it it's quite natural that's part of the learning isn't it it's the, yes. and, and I just think sometimes we over egg these things and label it and then someone's mm. going to create a business out of it and I, and I think that's that's great way of bursting um, the 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 bubble and I think mm. I'm going to be borrowing that one um uh, from you via you know <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Bartley yeah, yeah. You're, you're very welcome to it Janice I completely agree because what you're right about the labeling once you label something you know in, uh, that term imposter syndrome we have all experienced it at different points in our career you know I think when I first went into a sales position I said I had two years where I hadn't I, I wasn't trained in how to sell so I spent two years feeling uncomfortable in every conversation trying to figure out how do I make this work what what am I doing wrong and and what, what do I need to change to 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 improve and get the, these customers on board that, that went on for quite a while and then I learned how to follow a, a more rigid not rigid but more um structured sales approach and that really helped me same happened you know in my leadership career but even in sales you know I went through I was in three different companies, but about five or six different positions in sales. Every time I switched, I met a new customer, started to manage different accounts, went through all of that transition again and again. And, you know, we have to transform ourselves. That's the key, isn't it? The development of ourselves and improving our own performance and future potential. That only happens as you go through those moments of growth. So you have to feel that sense of, it's, it's kind of like being out of your depth and that's the way I think about it I'm out of my depth for a while I'll have to kick a little bit harder <laughs> to stay afloat and make sure that I'm able to succeed but it's that conversation that you have with yourself and managing your mindset throughout those those kind of moments that's really most impactful I think you know I really appreciate you sharing and being really honest about your experience and I would imagine that's why you're such a great coach to other people because you'll lay everything bare but where did that come from because that's quite difficult to do to be vulnerable and honest about the mistakes you've made and the lessons and you know just lay everything bare where did that come from in you well I I think it I think it came from in 2017 when I left the corporate world I had a I had a bit of a I had a very difficult couple of years 
um, I'd been working for a really difficult line manager who was, I was managing a very large business, kind of 50 plus million team of 40 plus people. And it was, a, it was, a, I'd, I'd been working in this organization for 18 years, but in that role for a couple of years, and I had some very difficult situations to manage them. We were selling into uh, a well-established market. There was a lot of price competition and I went through a really difficult period where actually it, it kind of ended with me exiting the corporate world. And then I retrained as a coach, set my own business up and thought, you know, I'm going to do things differently from here on in. And from that point, I think I I know I made a decision that actually I'm just going to be more open, more authentic, more who I really am inside. And it does take a bit of courage. But once you start doing that, once you start laying out, laying yourself open, I think the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's like anything, you know, it's another moment of growth, right? And, and that, I think for me, has been really beneficial because I don't then... I don't have to hide who I am. I don't have to pretend to be somebody I'm not. And, and it's really liberating, actually. And talking about our failures or talking about, you know, the moments where it didn't go according to plan and then, okay, this is how I got it back on track. That's really useful for somebody else because they can start to see, like, I can see that I might be heading down that road. And actually what Justin's experienced, if I can adopt just part of what he's telling me, it's going to help me avoid that trap. You now, people are still going to have to make their own mistakes and learn their own lessons because I think that they are some of the most important moments of growth for any of us. But if, you, if there are simple principles that you can start to adopt that help you avoid making those mistakes, it's really it's really useful. And for me, you know, it's it's really rewarding to see people make that transition, adopt some of those you know key pieces of advice, and see the results very early on. So I, th I think it, it's it's one having made that decision, but then it's the when you start to see people picking that up, appreciating it and it working for them, that kind of further reinforces the importance of being open, having those conversations. So I think it's been a bit of a journey over the last five or six years, uh, but but and one that I continue to go on, you know, just to, to be able to share that openness. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I can see that's made you not only a better person, but a better mm. leader as well. Mm. And, and you're influencing other leaders to, to do the same. And it's great when you're kind of sharing it from your own experience, you know, the pain um, yes. yourself. So uh, I do appreciate that. No, pleasure. So, My pleasure. <laughs> um, uh, this has just been such a fantastic conversation that we're oh, kind of running out of time and I'm really <laughs> sad about that. We'll have to get you on uh, on again. Yeah, so let, let me let me ask you, who is your hero or shero? Uh, so uh, in about the year, I think it was like late 90s, maybe it might have been 2000, actually. My, I was I was at my mother-in-law's house and um, she we were talking about professional development. She was a, a quite a senior manager in the NHS. And she asked me, she said, have you, uh, oh, she said, you must have heard of this guy, Tony Robbins. And I, at that point, I hadn't. She said, oh, okay. She said, let me give you this book. So she gave me his book, his first book, I think he'd written, Unlimited Power. And she said, oh, just have a quick look. At, let me show you a couple of videos. And she showed me a couple of Tony Robbins videos. And I, I was kind of blown away by just the approach he was taking to you know professional development personal development and helping people to kind of start to think about unlocking higher levels of potential and performance and it started me on a bit of a journey I then went uh, so I bought a number of his books I bought his uh, kind of CD uh, set which was kind of power I used to listen to those in my car on the way to either sales calls or the office or wherever I was going and I went on a bit of a journey with Tony Robbins and he really did spark my interest and passion for personal development and growth so when I think back you know if I, it, that immediate answer to that question is, is Tony Robbins and if anybody hasn't had the experience of Tony Robbins he's definitely worth looking up he's got a po podcast called the Tony Robbins podcast he has multiple resources, courses, programs. You can see him in person. You can, uh, you know, watch his um, his content on YouTube. He, he's very inspirational. I like made this transition from personal kind of power coaching into the business setting as well, and I'm, I've been quite impressed with him. So that that's the answer. Yeah, Tony Robbins because he really did kind of was the catalyst for my own personal and professional growth and development. Fantastic, fantastic. So how can listeners get hold of you, Justin? I'm on all the usual platforms, but LinkedIn is probably my go-to. So just look up Justin Lee, L-E-I-G-H, and you can find me there. 
Uh, I'm also on Linktree. So there's Linktree, uh, Justin Lee, and uh, there's a number of different links and resources. If anybody wants to, to make contact, I'd be very happy to, to have a conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being so such a great guest, you know, sharing all of your experience and, and knowledge. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Scale Yourselves podcast. Thank you, Justin. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Janice. Great conversation. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Scale Your Sales podcast. If you like this discussion, feel free to listen to other episodes or watch the captioned show on YouTube and subscribe to future episodes. I would really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you.